Hi, I'm Bill Roper and I'm Chief Creative Officer at Improbable. So I think the biggest uh, advantage that small developers get by being on Spatial OS, um, I mean, really is uh, one not having to write your own bespoke solution. Um, it's a, a huge amount of work, um, first of all. And I find that most studios of any size, like they really want to focus on making a great game. And unless they had some just passion for writing server code and really wanting to dig into that, um, it tends to be something that you have to do that maybe you don't necessarily really want to do, right? Um, also, there's just so much about Spatial um, that is um, going to provide solutions and opportunities for game development design that you're just not going to get on uh, building your own. Um, that's certainly no uh, way of looking at what people can make and how fantastic the code they're writing or their, their bespoke solutions are. Um, it's just more of a sense of the fact that you know we've got hundreds of engineers that have been working for years on figuring out distributed computing, um, how to actually enable um, different gameplay mechanics and different things that you can do um, by using Spatial OS. And the fact that we you know, then also act as your cloud provider. I think that's the last element that's really strong. Right? You're not having to then write that and then figure out, well, now where do I stand that up? What cloud service am I on? How am I doing that? Am I getting my own servers? Like going through all those things, like we manage all of that and we handle that and it's um, really transparent. I mean, within the first you know, half an hour of using Spatial OS, even if you go onto our open platform and use the SDK, you're actually up deploying your game in the cloud. So it's, it's very seamless to people and it makes it a way so that developers, you know, can really focus on the stuff that is going to differentiate what they're doing and make what they're doing really special and exciting and that's, you know, ultimately the gameplay. I think the biggest misconceptions that developers that talk with us about Spatial um, really tend to be around the fact that um, I think very early on we kind of got put in the boxes of either VR or MMORPGs, right? So people are either like, oh, so you somehow let us build virtual worlds and you're really only applicable to VR, or oh, so we can make really giant worlds and we can do really cool MMORPG stuff. Um, I think it's, uh, though both of those are true, and we certainly uh, do a lot for uh, those game platforms and those, those genres of games, um, it's, it's really so much more than that. Um, and that's the exciting thing that, um, that we get to do and I get to do here is when working with developers, finding out what it is, what's that, what are they trying to accomplish, what's the spirit of the game, um, and then what are the ways that we can actually help them uh, to reach that? How do we enable and empower them to, to hit those goals and those visions? Um, so whether that's an arena combat game, uh, whether that is uh, like a simulation based, like I want to make Sims, but I want to have the Sims with 100,000 people in it, you know, or whatever it is, or, or not even sheer numbers. Numbers, right? Because I think that is one of the misconceptions. Like, well, yeah, your game's great for sheer numbers, but what else? But if it's something we're saying, like, oh, no, I want to have a game that has the complexity of something like uh, an open world sandbox like Skyrim, right, for example. Um, like, what could I do with that? But could I do it online with, uh, with 100 people or 1,000 people, right? Because, you know, how do I make it like an MMO type thing, but really have that depth and complexity in those, you know, or have deep simulation or things like that. Um, uh, and I think that the more we look at those and you find, you know, the levers you can pull with that becomes super interesting um, and kind of starts breaking out of the, the, the lanes that people are most familiar with because I think they're the ones that get talked about the most, right? Like, oh, I can have a million people, a thousand people, or whatever it is, like some giant number I've never thought of before. Um, that's the easy one to get to. And I think when you start looking at the, the other big things we do, it um, starts to become the interesting conversations. I think one of the ways that Spatial really helps with experimentation, um, which is so important to, to, I think studios of any size, but definitely, you know, specifically indies, um, is the fact that um, it lets you get up and on the cloud and deployable um, incredibly quickly. So the thing that's really nice about that is it allows you um, 
in ways that are, that are not always as simple, depending, especially if you're using something like Unity, right? Um, or even if you're using Unreal, but trying to do some different things, like no matter what you're using to get there, this idea that um, I can, you know, within like the first day I'm trying something in prototyping, like I can send you a link, you can then be playing, we can be trying out multiplayer things right away. Uh, I think that's the, the biggest challenge, um, having done a bunch of multiplayer stuff myself, is like it's always lagging, you're always trying to build systems that you think are going to be really fun in multiplayer, but you know you're weeks or months away from the time you actually both first get to like, you know, like, oh, now I've got somebody else in the game, let's see, like, this. oh, wow, that actually wasn't very fun at all, <laughs> right? Like, we thought it was going to be awesome, and it's pretty much sucked. Um, the sooner you can do that, the faster you can iterate, and the more uh, easy it is, uh, or at least quickly it is, to start finding the fun. Um, and I think that's a, that's a, a huge way that we, we help with that very early on in the process. The interesting thing about Spatial OS is that, um, in terms of accurate replication, uh, is it's non-deterministic. So um, I think that's important from the standpoint. If you were looking at building something that was, for example, uh, like an eSport type game, if that was your goal, um, it's something that we're actually not good for only from the standpoint that um, one of the things that if you're playing StarCraft competitively, Right, is you or, or League of Legends or anything, is you almost have this idea that you can play the game and you can like roll it back, right? And then if you let it run again from there, it will do exactly the same thing, right? It's deterministic. That's actually not the way simulations work on spatial because of the distributed compute. Um, the simplest way to describe it is because you have multiple servers and they're all overlapping their authority. Like there are, there can be differences in almost like microseconds and when handoffs happen that can cascade to have like slightly different outcomes. Um, so that's the one that, that I almost always think about where it's like, well, how, how important is it for you to have that like exact granularity of back and forth? Almost like, you know, if I reround and watched it, is it gonna be exactly the same? It'll probably be like 99.9 .9 the same, um, but there can be like those tiny slight changes um, that, that would make it uh, in that way potentially inappropriate, depending on what you were building. Um, but I mean, other than that, it, it, it actually, um, you know, I think the thing that's fantastic about, about working on Spatial is that it, it lets you, in many, many ways, build the game you're trying to build. We give you a lot of control over what you do, when you do it, how you do it, um, and, and you're, you're able to, uh, by the way that we almost kind of take apart how a game runs, um, as opposed to everything running on a single server, you can take individual components and say, I want physics to be run by a different, a different game server, and I want Pathfinder by this and AI here, and different elements of the game kind of broken out. It actually lets you do things in different ways um, than you would normally be able to do because of how a single game server requires you to do things, like things are locked into the game loop. Um, so you can actually come up with some pretty different, interesting, unique things to go after um, that I think actually gives um, studios of any size um, a lot of control and, and I think gives indie studios especially who I find to be always just really pushing innovation, the ability to try some really crazy stuff, which is the exciting thing about seeing what they do when they get on the platform. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question about how do you go about design where when you have a world that just goes on forever, right? And you could see where, well, this person's been playing their character for four years, right? And it's actually progressed and grown and changed um, different than you would see in, in, a, in a normal MMO, for example. Like, how does the new player come in and not immediately feel like, I, okay, how do I how do I find my way, right? It, it's almost, not to be too philosophical, it's almost kind of like life, right? When someone comes into the world, they don't look at it and say, like, well, I have nothing I can do in, in life and in the world, because man, look at these people that have been here for 30, 40, 50, 70 years, and you know, the world's changed around them. Um, it does make you think about things a little more in that way, like how social relationships work. Like, are you designing systems that encourage people and reward people that have been in the game for a long time and have built up um, these uh, achievements in the world and, and a relationship with the world, if you will, to, to come and help newer players, right? To, to move them along. It's almost uh, a bit like parenting, right? It's not like, I had a kid, hey, 
best of luck, Junior. Hope you make it through. Like, see you in 10 years. Let me know how things are going. Like, you, there's a, there's a, a intrinsic reward that's given, uh, you know, almost on an emotional level for parents to, you know, take that child and nurture it and bring it up. You, you know, you could be building systems that very much interact in that same way. I mean, there's ways to do it mechanically where you get, you know, advantages and special things that you give, um, you give to characters and to players that are, you know, mentoring younger players and things like that, um, that kind of not only help them get into the world, um, but, but almost in a way um, help guide their experience, right? I, but I think a lot of it is as you look at being able to have deeper simulation, larger worlds, having that persistence, things like that, um, should be driving us to create um, not games that are more difficult, but games that are more complex. Right, that have a really deep complexity to them, to where um, your success in the game starts coming with like, what are the things that you're seeing that maybe someone else didn't see? What are the experiences you have that maybe no one else did? And maybe as a new player, there's things that I can do and experiences I can have and things I can create that actually someone who started the game 10 years ago couldn't because they didn't exist, right? I mean, if you think about it now, there's things that we do uh, in the world that 10 years ago, like you just couldn't because technology didn't exist to do it, right? The systems weren't there to, to realize that. So I think that becomes part of the interesting parts of design is thinking about what the evolution of your world would be and your game space would be and making sure that um, because because it's a live game and it's always up and running and it's and it's that game is a service mentality what am I doing to constantly like add systems to the world and add things to the world that lets new players come in and say wow hey here's a thing I can do because of when I started and what was available to me that like actually that person never got to do right and so then that lets me actually have a, a very uh, special and meaningful place in the world too um, that's not dependent on time that I've spent playing the game but more when I got to start playing the game Yeah, so it's really interesting. One of the things that, that spatial is great for is scale. So in terms of not only size of world, but number of players, but really number of entities. So in terms of how that relates to like having hordes of enemies, right? Having just like, we, we, we really want to see somebody who's basically saying like, I want to make the Battle of Helm's Deep, right? And in fact, everybody in there is a player, right? That's the, like the craziest extreme. Would that be fun? I don't know, maybe it would completely not be fun. But it, but, but it could be, right? I think people thought like, oh, 100 people in a, in a first person, third person shooter? Like, how would that be fun? That would really suck. And then PUBG came out and they're like, oh, that's how it would be fun. Wow, that's super cool. Everybody should go make one now, right? So there'll be people pushing that and saying like, or it's like, is it, what is it like having, you know, here's my squad of 20 people, like these 20 players, and we're actually, you know, playing against like 500 enemies coming in or a thousand enemies coming in. Um, that is definitely something um, that goes right with the grain of what we do. Um, and in fact, we do scale tests um, all the time. We'll have like, here's a thousand players and here's 5,000 enemies. And like, are we supporting that? Is that running? Yep, that's great. Like, we kind of internally play with ideas like, would that be fun? How would that look? Because I think that's, that's the other part of the question, right? And we don't want to um, have to solely leave that to designers and to, to companies to try to figure out if there's things that we can be experimenting with and things that we can point to, um, to at least be a part of the conversation um, about what might work and not work and you know um, ultimately like part of my job here is not to make people's games but it's to try to provide the the fact that I get to work with the teams and the tech every day and as we come up with what's the next thing Spatial is going to do or what does it do now and like hey this is really interesting we tried that that was really fun that was really interesting to give that information out right and to kind of be there as a, as a, a partner uh, and someone to to just kind of like uh, offer an ear almost sometimes um, in that way. Uh, and I think that's the thing is that it's, it's very open to that experimentation. So like, I would love to see somebody who's like, I'm gonna build a game that's all about just like massive hordes of enemies and players fighting each other and what is that like? Because um, that is like definitely something you could be going and tackling with Spatial.